I'm on right over there. Hey everyone, I'm Bill Winterberg, founder of FBPAD. Joining me, GJ King, uh, president of RA in a Box. Thanks, Bill. Really appreciate it. It's great, great to be here. Cool. Well, we're here. Thanks for coming to FBPAD HQ to do a uh, demonstration of what is uh, offered in the RA in a Box platform. But I also have a couple of notes here where in today's broadcast, I want to talk about some of the new conversations around the DOL rule okay. with new news that just came out the other day. Uh, also updates on Form ADV that's coming later this year that anyone who has uh, registration and does the Form ADV needs to fill out. Sure. And we've got some follow-up about how you were able to win the Best in Show Award at the Fuse Hackathons two years in a row. So I want to dive into a little bit of that. And I've got one question that came in from some of my followers on Twitter okay. that will handle. Uh, so take us uh, and get us started with uh, what you want to talk about on uh, compliance on compliance stuff. What'd you bring for me to talk about today? Sure, I mean, maybe a few things, touch on, on uh, a, a few things, just uh, going down your list a little bit there. Look, uh, fr fresh in the news as of uh, yesterday evening is the uh, an update on the DOL rule. Um, so uh, we've, um, you know, there's been a lot of chatter about this for, for geez, for it seems like forever now, but uh, you know, a bit of a, I'd say, a surprise maybe to some advisors, the DOL came out uh, yesterday evening uh, and, and kind of confirmed that this, this June 9th, 2017 yep. applicability date is going to stand. Yep. Uh, I think there had been a lot of hope and perhaps dreaming out there that this, this, this would continue to get pushed back further. And it, it seems like this is, this is going to stand at this point. So I think for, for RIA firms in particular, it's, it's very important that they, they, they acknowledge and understand that this is going to cause some changes to their operations. It's, it's manageable, but it's not something that can be ignored. Um, and, and just to get into the weeds slightly on that is as of June 9th, 2017, so really uh, less than 20 days away, you're going to have to comply with the impartial conduct standards whenever you're interacting with someone around an IRA recommendation. So there's also a lot of, I think, some confusion around this at times where this only is applicable to rollover situations where you're, you're maybe rolling over from a, from a qualified retirement plan into an IRA account. That seemed to be that the conventional discussion and, and, is it applied only to rollovers. And, and that is a primary focus of this in, in a very common scenario, particularly for an RIA firm. Yeah. Um, but you're also, anytime you're recommending someone switch from an existing IRA uh, you know, uh, account into your RA, uh, an IRA that you're going to be managing, this rule applies. So perhaps they're with a, a brokerage firm under a commission plan yeah. and you're converting them into a, a fee-based or fee-only type plan, you really are going to have to think about that. It's not just about rollover recommendations. So I think it's really important that people understand that this rule does touch not just rollovers, but a few other things as yeah. well. Yeah. Yep. And so we've got your slide up here about what other uh, scenarios, we talked about those IRA rollover situation, but what about some of the trends that you're seeing in the switch of commission-based to fee-based IRAs? Uh, what, what, from a technology perspective, are you know, people who are watching the, the FBPAD updates, what do they need to be considerate of in how they bill for some of these accounts that fall under the new fiduciary requirements? Sure, so it's interesting, so you, you bring up the commission, the fee-based rule, so it's interesting, yep. so this touches the, uh, the, the new requirements from, from a DOL standpoint uh, as far as the fiduciary rule, but also, um, this has kind of been a, a focus of the SEC for some time as well. So since one of these rules are kind of uh, converging a bit, so there's this, this kind of uh, phrase out there of kind of reverse churning, um, right? Which has been out there for many, uh, and which is which is a legitimate issue where you have a you know a client who maybe was in a commission based account, really you know transacted, and now you're you're shifting them into a fee based account, and now you're charging them a fee, and there's there's a, there's some fair arguments there is that is that in the best interest of the client? Right. You've also seen a similar. This is funny. It also kind of converges to another topic. That's an SEC exam priority right now is around rat fee programs. So in a very similar mm -hmm. scenario, you have let's just to kind of explain that for a moment. You have a, a client perhaps that's in a traditional uh, advisory account where they are paying an advisory fee to the advisor, but they pay uh, transaction fees commissions directly to the the broker executing those trades. So in a traditional RIA custody situation from a traditional custodian, be it a Schwab or TD Ameritrade, etc., when you shift them into a rat fee account that advisor is now having a direct uh, a relationship with that custodian and they are paying all those transaction costs on behalf of the client. So then in theory, you're providing them with a bundled solution that is, hey, for now for 1%, you know, 1 we're gonna cover all those transaction costs. Yeah. But there's been a lot of scrutiny and, and some challenges from a regulatory standpoint of firms, you know, maybe shifting someone to a rat fee account and then not, you know, maybe it wasn't the client's best interest. So you're seeing a lot of movement around this. So it's not just IRAs. It's kind of there's, there's this, there are, there are, these these rules are converging. Um, and when it comes to technology, I mean, look, this is a technology challenge, but also just 
look, you, you need to operate in your, in your client's best interest. If you're an RIA and you may be a fee-only RIA, which, which is a great business model, but if it doesn't make sense for that person to, to, to shift into your model, it, it may not be the right fit. Just because you only charge a fee and that's how you conduct business, you have to be careful that that's in, in your client's best interest, where I think this rule is really gonna, is gonna put that into focus. And perhaps I think that's a good thing for the industry overall. Sure, and I've had a conversation with Michael Kitsis about this on Twitter, about technology applied to fiduciary mm -hmm. compliance. And Michael had a great statement where he said, you could be using an abacus in your business, but still be a fiduciary because it's more about putting the client's interests first, not about the components of technology that you have. It's just that technology allows an advisor to be a more efficient fiduciary or perhaps a, a more well-informed fiduciary because mm -hmm. you can now use technology to uh, count how many transactions were affected in an account for 12 mm -hmm. years, add up what the fee would mm -hmm. be on that, compare it to the fees in a wrap account and evaluate and compare and contrast and make some determinations, I guess, as a fiduciary, which type of environment or which type of account profile would really be in the best interest mm -hmm. of, of a client. Yeah, I think you touched on an interesting point there. I think, um, so, you know, our general approach with technology and the fiduciary rules, we've been a bit cautious and kind of advised our clients and others in this space to, you know, don't jump into the, the latest, you know, newest kind of shiny object as it relates to fiduciary rule technology. Yeah. There's been a lot of stuff thrown out there. A lot of people trying to really focus on this niche. It's a neat marketing it, 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 aspect. It's a great technology. marketing aspect. And look, you're seeing a lot of these things. And to be fair, I think some of those may have relevancy, but I think there was a lot, kind of, and we're throwing kind of the kitchen sink at it and hoping something kind of sticks. We've yeah. really preached and believe this, that you can utilize a lot of the existing technology that you have. This does not necessarily require purchasing new technology, but you need to really be thoughtful and really maybe engage and adopt technology more than you have before. So you may have a CRM system sitting on the shelf there that you know, you're using maybe more as, as a note-taking system today. This is an opportunity to really think about putting that process in that CRM system. Yeah. So is this in the client's best interest? Well, look, this, is a, this needs to be a documented process. You don't need to go buy a new workflow tool you need to utilize that existing CRM system yeah. in a more productive way. Yeah. And the other thing you mentioned is around fees. I do think you're gonna see some, some advancement technology around fees and having full transparency into these accounts. Um, there's some interesting things happen. I think Morningstar is working on some interesting tools, even a, like- Yeah, a, best interest scorecard exactly, from Exactly, you know, some of these new aggregation tools, something like a cool one. There are some cool things happening there where the cost of technology and access to data is just is, is very much accelerating. I think you know one of the requirements of the impartial conduct standards is you need to charge a reasonable fee, and that's a you know look there's there's not a lot of great guidance on that, and that's a right. tricky thing. So how do you charge a reasonable fee? Well, it's a fair statement to say well you don't know if it's reasonable unless you kind of have some benchmarking and, and, and real view of kind of what the others are charging. And so, that requires that data collection. Exactly. You see, you know, Ryan and a few others are starting to think about. So there are, there are a lot of people that possess some really interesting, compelling data as it relates to fees today, and that that's always been talked about but hasn't gotten as much focus. I think the next few months you're going to see a lot more people that already hold on to this data that are sitting in really interesting parts of the technology ecosystem. Yeah. And they're going to do some really interesting things to start putting that information out there for firms to start benchmarking themselves. Well, for, and it's, again, it's hard to say, well, advisor charge 1%. So what are you providing for that 1%? Are you, are you providing just asset management services? Are you providing financial planning services? So really, so the fee data, in a it's, high level. it's one thing it's helpful but you then have to kind of there's that other level okay what is it what you know you, you can charge look i think that there's some also on this rule you can charge a higher fee it does not have to be be lower cost but you but you, you really need to understand what do you, what is that client or that prospect receiving for that higher fee and right. is it justified perhaps it is it very well may be justified i think there's been some bad information i think oh I, is, is, do i have to charge less no now look if you're providing a, a worse service for a higher fee Perhaps you need to There's be some thinking. liability there, 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 that, that That's a legitimate problem. But if you're mm -hmm. providing a much higher touch, much more holistic wealth management experience, there's a, there's a lot of good arguments around. You can charge a premium for that service, but you really want to make sure you're documenting that and, and really thinking about that in detail. And again, that technology can help create processes, create conventions around that documentation so that the record keeping systems, the CRMs, and as well as the related systems, any advisor can use that, I guess, to prove their case because the burden is on the advisor to prove that they're delivering appropriate service for the fee that they're charging. That's where the burden mm -hmm. is. So there's some technology that exists that advisors can leverage, use a little bit better and more uh, features of what they're using today just to, I guess, be in a better prepared yeah, position. Yeah, I think the challenge of the deal role and a fair critique at times is that there isn't a lot of very 
specific guidance. It's it's, it's a principles based rule. A lot of gray area. And there's a gray and, and there, look, there's there's an elegance that that's in many ways very thoughtful, but also creates some challenges from a compliance standpoint. But I think you hit on a very important important point there is that ultimately the burden of proof is on the advisor. Yeah. And and that's they have to understand just because the, the Department of Labor doesn't doesn't specify exactly what needs to happen, you need to prove that you acted in the client's best interest, and you, you need to be thoughtful. So I think for example, we've talked a lot about the level fee fiduciary kind of more streamlined exemption, which we've advocated. You know, RIA firms should really be focused on and continue to advocate that approach. But just because the DOL says you don't need to have new policies and procedures if you're a level fee advisor doesn't mean that you probably shouldn't have those. And Because right. how do you actually comply with this unless you have policy procedures, unless you have documentation? So I think that's going to be a challenge for some firms to get their arms around is, you know, you look at the impartial conduct standards, it says, oh, you need, you know, but how do you actually prove that you yeah. did that? You need to have documentation. You need to use technology. So when you pull up that, that client's record in your CRM system, you have a documented process of why this was in their best interest. Yeah. And it's codified, sortable, all those things, not just a long list of notes, which is better than nothing, but actually be able to sort through, well, this is the, the cost they were paying before. This is the cost they're paying now. Here's your justification. Here's who signed off on that. Here's what was discussed with the client, et cetera, et cetera. I want to talk about something advisors can get their hands around with respect to compliance. So you have a, another slide here talking about changes that are uh, upcoming to form ADV requirements. Can you just walk us through some of these changes that are happening that advisors need to prepare for so when they get their latest version of their disclosure documents in order that everything is satisfies the new requirements. Sure. So one of the, uh, I think, downsides of all the, the publicity around the DOL Fiduciary Rule is that this this other change that will impact all RIA firms that, that's effective as of October 1st yeah. hasn't, has, hasn't gotten as much as much attention. That's what we uh, see here, yeah. Yeah, it, and it's, it's uh, and I think this is quickly going to, as, as we kind of get, I'd say you're going to have a few more months of DOL Rule, DOL Rule, and then come probably like early fall, late summer, advisors sometimes tend to wait till the last minute, there's going to be a realization of, oh my gosh, the uh, the form ADV is changing. Yeah. Uh, and, and a little nuance here just to explain what's going on is as of October 1st, 2017, uh, when your firm goes into the online filing system and tries to file an amendment, you will not be able to file that amendment unless you provide additional information that is now required as part of the new form ADV. Okay. So if you're going in uh, you know, on October 2nd and just trying to make a quick update to your form ADV, maybe updating your assets under management or, or total number of employees, you're not going to be able to do that and just make that filing. It's going to it's going to lock you into the system until you enter in all this additional information. <laughs> so this is there's some confusion around. Oh, well, I can wait to do this till my annual renewal next year, which is true. You're going to be required to do this as part of your firm's annual renewal, assuming you have kind of a December 31st fiscal year end. But what could kind of trap you in this is if you go in in November unexpectedly. And all of a sudden now you're, you're kind of like, oh geez, I, I can't file my ADV now. Now I need to go out and gather all this additional information yeah. and I need to file my, my ADV update. So a, a, a few things yeah, that, that, that I particularly focused on, I, maybe you know, some of these do touch on technology actually a bit, is look, there's been a big focus on social media, obviously from an adoption standpoint in this industry. And now you know, there, there, are, there are compliance implica implications of that as well. So for the first time ever, the, the SEC is requiring that firms disclose their company's social media pages. So this does not require individual reps or advisors of a firm to disclose their own personal social media addresses. Okay. So that's clear. It's not for personal yep. accounts. Yep. It's for accounts used for business purposes. Exactly. And, and then this will be so if you are, you know, XYZ, you know, financial advisor and you have a Twitter page or and you have a Facebook page, those addresses will now need to be disclosed. And look, why is that? So look, uh, the reality is the SEC and the states have been looking for this this information during exams for, for a while now. Before they walk in for an exam, you should expect that the regulator has Googled you, checked out all your social media. That's part of their job and they're doing that today yeah. and, and they're getting, but I, I think what you're going to see, and though there hasn't been as much maybe clear guidance about, let, let's take this a step forward by having all this data into their system in a sortable fashion. As technology evolves, it does. You should expect the SEC is going to have direct Twitter feeds of all these advisors pulling into their system pretty soon, and direct Facebook feeds. So when there's, you know, screens on keywords, so if you're posting to Twitter, and, and that's where I was going, yeah, is they're going to look for look, keywords. Look, big data is an overused term here, but it, the, by by you know having this data re readily available, you need look. Technology is out there already to, to have these feeds. I think you're going to see and look. The, the SEC deserves credit. They're coming a long way from a technology standpoint, yeah. and this is just a further step towards that. And again, it's nothing to be overly concerned about as a Having a social media page is very common. It's, it's actually probably a great argument to have one, yep. but you need to be thoughtful about that. Um, second thing on here is uh, disclosing the use of outsourced chief compliance officers. Okay. Um, and this is a topic that sometimes is a, is a little murky for people. And what they're really describing here is if you have hired an outsourced individual uh, to serve as your firm's chief compliance officer who also serves as a chief compliance officer of other firms. 
Um, there's been some guidance and kind of more commentary issued by the SEC a, a few years back on this. They've, they've seen some problems with this model. We as a firm really discourage this practice. We don't think it's a good practice from a compliance standpoint. And again, back to the data question, now what they're going to require is, you know, before the SEC could kind of piece this together, they had the ability to kind of, but it was a little clunky for them to kind of piece together the map. Okay, you're the CCO of how many firms? Well, now if you're utilizing a CCO that is also a CCO of another firm, you need to disclose that and list off the other firms. So as the SEC looks about their risk scoring of how they're, who they're prioritizing for exams, I think it's a reasonable expectation that if you have an outsourced CCO that's also a CCO of a few other firms, it's, it's going to raise your risk score. And now they have that data you know, very much more readily accessible to put into their algorithm to really kind of prioritize for exams. Yeah. So I think that's an a, a indication of while this practice may technically be allowed, expect a lot of scrutiny on that and even more to come. Um, you know, and then if, these last three on here are, are really about kind of gathering more detailed information about how advisors are, are managing assets. Um, so, you know, today, you know, if you think about how assets under management are disclosed on, on the Form ADV, it's pretty high level. You, you have kind of discretionary assets, non-discretionary assets, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now you're going to have to also disclose the AUM a lot of different ways. So by types of clients. So no longer saying, hey, our percentage of assets are in this bucket of maybe, you know, zero to 25 percent, whatever it may be. Right. You now have to disclose the exact regulatory assets under management for each client type. And those all need to sum up and roll together. So this is where systems and technology are. Look, if you're a small firm and only have a handful of clients, you know, this is a little bit of a nuisance. Not, not you know, it's pretty easy to manage. But if you are a firm... You, know, you better have, you know, when you talk about portfolio management reporting systems, having that categorization now is going to become, it, it, you needed it before, but now it's becoming a, a real must have because you're going to have to reconcile that data and those numbers don't reconcile. You actually can't file your form ADV, which is a right. problem. Um, or it's just going to take weeks to aggregate that data. Exactly. The numbers don't roll up. So I'm just forecasting, I think, for anyone using a portfolio management system, they need to know how the system is set up to do that client segmentation or classification and then somehow generate a report uh, on a specific date that coincides with their Form ADV filing. And so if the portfolio accounting system doesn't do that already, I guess they need to release that soon. Mm -hmm. And then for any advisor and their employees gathering that data, they need to today figure out how to identify each client segment, which corresponds to the Form yep. ADV, and make sure that they can generate a report. It's a lot of work up front, mm -hmm. but hopefully one time. Exactly, yeah, it, but, but back to like workflows and processes, you know, making sure a new client comes on board now, are you properly categorizing that client? You have to in, identify in, in it. In your system, because then when you run the end of year report, all of a sudden you have a bunch of, now you're you know, scattered around, talking to different advisors at the firm, trying to classify this at the last minute, yeah. leads to mistakes, which lead to problems. So having yeah. a, a process- we don't want any problems we don't we don't like mistakes we don't like problems when it comes to compliance so and then just lastly here again we talked about rap fee programs a bit before but long story short is they're asking for a lot more detailed information about separately managed accounts and rap fee programs and separately managed accounts the definition of that is pretty much everything so i think some people are like oh separately managed accounts i don't know if you are you know managing a, a client's account you're using you know exchange traded funds mutual funds individual securities you're charging a fee on that account. That's pretty much a separately managed account. So, uh, so it doesn't matter that you're using like a, a TAMP or an outside money manager. Nope. nope. Yeah, it's not a requirement. Nope. It does not. Um, okay. But and there's and there's actually be more details around that as well. Who sponsors these programs? Who where, uh, there's gonna be more detail around who you're custodying with and having more breakouts of where your securities are held. So just a lot more detail around this. And again, I think as the SEC looks big picture, they're trying to get a better sense of where our assets held. So when there are structural issues at these different custodians, you know, down the road, you know, hopefully those issues don't ever happen. But if there are issues at a particular bank or institution, they'd like to have better data to really look through and say, okay, wow, this actually impacts 3,000 RIA firms at this level. You wouldn't know at first glance, but so they're going to have a lot more access to data. Ultimately, that's their goal, I believe, to yeah. be able to roll this up to high level. How important, wow, this is actually more impactful than we realize. And also just from a risk scoring standpoint, you know, looking at more detailed types of use of derivatives. And there's different thresholds for larger firms once they hit over a certain asset level. So over 500 million of assets, you actually have to disclose even more detail. So it kind of steps up as, as your firm grows. But you know, I think it's just, again, nothing to panic about. These are not, you know, these, this should not, you know, Why, did you see the panic in my eyes no, no, as I was thinking about this? I, I sense a slight sense of, oh my gosh, just, I'm a little scared now. But no, this is manageable. 
but you don't want to wait to the end. And this is again where technology is actually could be really, really helpful to, to think about. It's this. so it's the end of May now. There's enough time to address the fiduciary rule implementation, then a little bit of hopefully downtime in the summer to prepare for, for what we've seen here for collecting social media pages, disclosure over compliance officers, and then the accounting system getting mm -hmm. that set up. So you're you're absolutely right. Don't wait until September 30th. Because once you get into the ADV online system, you're kind of stuck mm -hmm. at that point. So mm -hmm. it's best to be prepared than to get in that uh, position of having the ADV form open it, it, and not being able yeah, to progress and, and that's it. what we're trying to spend time with our clients and just put the word out there, you know, through our different channels and, and writing. We've written about this in the past. Just, look, this is... You can't ignore this because it actually impacts everyone. Uh, look, the fiduciary rule, you can argue there's some firms where it has more impact or less impact. And look, that's true to some extent, but this this impacts everyone. Like it you're does. not gonna be able to file your ADV, which by the way, everyone has a form ADV. So, uh, and I think, you know, it's gonna impact everyone. So it's just yeah. something about, again, not trying to, we look, we don't we don't sell fear, but this is, this is very manageable, yeah. but don't, you know, utilize technology because if you don't, it's gonna be a challenge. Right, and so, uh, to segue, I want to switch over. We're going to switch the uh, over here to the dashboard that you have set up, and you, as uh, RI in a box, you know, get to a spot where you're you're sure, good sure. to, I think to I run may, the demo uh, to make here. Sure, we don't time at time out here. Uh, so I'll buy some time by talking sure. about uh, sure. some of the impressive feats because you've collected some serious hardware at the Fuse hackathons hosted by Orion Advisor Services, uh, which is incidentally going to be coming up once again this September. Uh, for a large hackathon community. You won Best in Show two years in a row. Uh, and so you had some pretty, and I, I guess I'm biased as a judge because part of my vote helps you secure your uh, award as Best in Show. Um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be sending you the gift later. <laughs> that's, that's right, we'll put in the box back over here. Um, but you've got just a, a few minutes to walk through the dashboard. Right, let's keep it to like three minutes. Sure, keep yeah, it nice sorry, and, sorry, nice and I try to navigate your, uh, your Mac here. Is this, uh... All right, so what are we looking at here in uh, in your dashboard? Sure, so this is a, our compliance calendar tool and, and, and really kind of explain how, how we think about the compliance calendar tool is, again, we were just actually talking about the Form ADV, so there's some relevancy here is, you know, we think actually a lot of compliance data ties into compliance very much. I think you're gonna see more and more of that for years to come, where if you think about it, there may be a few hundred compliance tasks that a, a, an RIA firm needs to do, but to a particular RIA firm, there only may be a few dozen or, or more, but it's really gonna be based on, on, on you know, what they're doing as a business. So the first thing we do when, when we bring on a firm onto our, our software platform here is we, we look and programmatically scan their form ADV to, to, to really kind of figure out what type of firm, do, do they have custody? Do they have other things that may trigger additional compliance activities? We then programmatically are gonna look through and build uh, from a setting standpoint, many things that are gonna then fill into their compliance calendar. So, and then the calendar, if you think about this, is for the chief compliance officer, becomes really their main dashboard of things they need to do. Good. So, you know, if you plug in here on AML train, et cetera, et cetera, you're gonna be able to go in here, complete that on a certain date. And everything you do in our system is then gonna flow into the compliance log. And, and this compliant, excuse me, compliance log really becomes the repository of everything that your firm is doing. And so when you go through that regulatory exam, you now have the ability to document and show what, what's going on across your firm. And it's better because it's consolidated in one place as opposed to saving it to a file shared, you know, the online file storage. You might drag and drop in the wrong folder or, you know, just stuff is in random places. And maybe if you have a succession issue with the chief compliance officer, the way that the first CCO did things may not be the way the second CCO does things. So the ability to log it all in one central place, I see a big benefit to that. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's just organization is a big challenge, efficiency organization. Uh, you know, the ability to filter this, you can turn this on for different members of your firm that are helping with compliance. You can use, so it's all fully customizable, fully downloadable into Excel, CSV, all those types of things. And this is actually a huge tool for firms of really all sizes. This is one of our tools where I think it actually is relevant to everyone. Uh, and then, you know, one other feature that I'll maybe just, just, just uh, touch upon here as well that you know as we talk about you know a bit about this kind of modular approach where one thing we always think about with compliance is I think sometimes a mistake we can all make is assuming that compliance is the same for every firm and the route is this industry is you know an, your average RA firm is, is many different uh, specifications so right. you have lots of solo advisory practices out there where it's a one-person firm that's the most common scenario in our industry it often gets overshadowed you often read about these large firms but 
that is the bread and butter of this industry are those small solo advisory mm -hmm. firms. So we want to make sure the system is, is, is practical for them, doesn't overwhelm them with things that aren't relevant to them, but also can really help them from an educational standpoint. You often have an advisor that situation that's new to compliance, right? They, they're, they're very excited about having their own firm, but compliance is not something they've done before. They know it's important. So we want to kind of give them the tools to, to walk them through and document so that they're prepared for an audit. But as I show you here as well, you know, as you kind of scale up uh, and you start bringing on uh, more, more employees and staff members and advisors to, to your firm, um, all of a sudden this concept of supervision and, and kind of you know, monitoring you know, what's going on at your firm becomes a lot more relevant. Right. So the system also has a number of supervision tools built into this, which okay. is relevant to larger firms. So yeah. as an example, if I, you know, as, as a, a rep who logs in, I'm gonna see a much more consolidated view, not gonna be overwhelmed as much as a chief compliance officer may see on here. They're gonna be prompted to do different things from, from, uh, from a regular standpoint. So review the policies and procedures manual when it gets updated, all that's done digitally and attested to digitally. But in addition, just as an example, uh, you know, they may be able to submit advertising and marketing materials for review to their CCO. Mm. Um, all this is kind of, you know, again, all rolls into the compliance log. But I'm just as an example going to say, uh, you know, I would like to submit a new outside uh, business activity request for, uh, for an example here. I'm going to just type real estate, keep it simple and submit that request to our system. I'm now going to log off as the rep of the firm. I'm now going to log back in as the CCO of mm -hmm. the firm here. And as, as I do that, um, when I you kind of get us, get us back in here, the CCO, of course, is going to see a, a much more uh, robust dashboard on here. They're going to have a lot more tools you know, that, they're, they're, that they're dealing with and are relevant to them. So just to see how the system all kind of ties together, kind of lastly here, is uh, the CCO is going to be able to track different things going to the firm. Maybe there's a cybersecurity policy they've, they've uploaded and, and they're seeing who's reviewed that or has, has agreed to review it and a different pending kind of uh, requests on that. In addition, back to this activity request, they're going to have the ability for the, for example, the, the real estate request here. So outside business activity oh. comes in, they get an alert. This can be set with different you know, settings from an email standpoint as well. Maybe they say we allow this request. Uh, you know, they decide, hey, this is no big deal. I, I'm okay with that. But this is where kind of the human element ties into technology. And, and we're big believers that the, the best compliance solution is one that couples technology and, and human expertise together. We don't think it's really one or the other. We do think it's both. Much like you talk about in the advisor space, the ultimate solution is, is perhaps not either or, it, it's both. And we, we, have a, we, we really believe the same thing as it relates to compliance. So if you, for example, have not disclosed this activity to your consultant at our firm, now we're going to ask for additional details because this may trigger additional updates to your form ADV, things that you're not thinking about in the moment. So now you've documented the request which is great, but you may now have a disclosure issue or your form ADV may not be a speed. So we always want to kind of tie tie everything together. So again, that was just a quick kind of preview, kind of a snapshot of some of the tools that, that we're working on. And uh, we'll continue to kind of think about new features as it relates to the fiduciary rule, the new form ADV changes to, again, combine that human element of expertise and keep people informed, but also find ways to streamline this and make it more practical. Now I get to put you on the spot because in advance of October 1st, will RA in a box be uh, generating forms that reps can fill in their social accounts so the CCO can collect it through this system? Yeah, and actually our system already does that today. Oh, so, cool. Because so, as a best practice, you know, you, you, you as the CCO need to be monitoring those accounts. So, you know, there, so, so yep. while the, maybe the Form ADV hasn't required it from a, from a compliance practice standpoint, a lot of this has already been relevant. So tools like that will become more relevant. Uh, also maybe back to Fuse, we talked about earlier about, you know, with, with Orion, just as an yep. example there. So one of our early in integrations with Fuse uh, that, that's really had widespread adoption among, among our clients is the ability to pull in information from Orion system to know where your clients are located from a registration standpoint, right. which triggers, you know, one of the big challenges for firms as they grow is not being registered in the proper jurisdiction. So we now can programmatically look at your firm real time. Where are you registered? Look to see where your house are, households are, not just individual clients, but at the household level, kind of, you know, be able to juxtapose that information next to each other and do a real time check. So I mentioned that because the new form ADV we talked about before with a lot of this information sitting in the portfolio management reporting systems, I think there's gonna be more opportunity to pull in that information in our systems so when the firm's going through their annual renewal process, we're gathering this information about, hey, what's your latest number of accounts or how is your assets under management allocated between clients? We should be able to pull that data programmatically from these systems to yeah. streamline that. So look, we still want the advisor to sign off on that, make sure everything is, there's not some outside accounts that maybe aren't being captured, but there are gonna be more ways that our system, I think through integrations and other ways can, can really push that forward. Good, good. Well, I had one question lined up, but I think in the interest of time, I wanna jump over to the, the final slide here, just so advisors can, can figure out where they can get more information about RA in a Box. So we have that up here on the screen. Obviously your website, rainabox.com, and you have resources 
resources, not only for independent RIAs, but hybrid firms, as well as broker dealer firms and their reps. Uh, it's clearly got to be the best place to go and get information on the benefits of your product. Yes, and, and, and thank you for that. Uh, highly encourage everyone to check out our blog. It's something that we're passionate about. Um, you know, we are generally blogging once or twice a week on a variety of topics like you just referenced. Good, and you can embed this broadcast right in your blog. Exactly, and, <laughs> and we will. And, and, but it, but the blog, I really encourage you. It's something we encourage our clients to read, but also just people in the industry. We're happy. Look, we're, we put a lot of information. We'll look, we, we are big advocates for this industry. We love this space, and you know, I really just want people to get the information. And again, Bill, thank you for, for having me today. It was a true pleasure, and, and thank you for all that you do for the industry. It's it's been, it's been a lot of fun being here and look forward to kind of continuing our conversation in the yeah. future. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks for coming here to, sorry we couldn't have sunny Atlanta. It's rainy today, but anyone who's watching the broadcast, again, the website, riainabox.com, even follow on Twitter, right? RIA in a box. And when you do blog posts about useful compliance information, I'll retweet them and share them out with, with the community. And I think anyone else watching can do the same. Okay. So I appreciate you uh, with your time this morning. Uh, head out to the website, head to Twitter, go get more resources and information, but I appreciate your time in helping uh, get me up to speed on DOL rule updates and the Form ADV changes and, and some of the additions you've made to your product. It's going to be okay though, just remember, it's, it's going to be okay. We, 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 look, the RA space is in, in, in a great space right now that, you know, as we move more to this fiduciary world, I really do believe our RIA firms are situated, you know, in an exceptional place right now. So while there are more things to come on the regulatory side, please don't get distracted by this. There, there is real opportunity in this space as well. Yeah, great. I feel better prepared already. That's great. Well, thank you, Bill. All right, DJ. All right, thank you, everyone, thank for you. your participation. See you next time.